Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, church, turn with me back to the first chapter of Isaiah. Let me tell you, I'm going to do better tonight. I'm going to preach, teach better tonight because I sat right down there in the middle of two fireballs for just a few minutes. And if, you're, if you came from the other side of the holler, they're called fireballs. Uh, but uh, having sat there that length of time, you, you never know what people are going to say. You know, a few weeks ago I was preaching that series on the Holy Ghost. And uh, I had a fella, a visitor, come down to the altar area after service. And uh, he doesn't attend here. He's only been here twice. And he shook my hand and he said, you are a theologian with a flamethrower. That's what he called me. <laughs> now, I've been called a lot of things, but not that, not ever. And so we preachers kid, our, we kid each other about these names sometimes. Brother, Brother Clifford Waters, my friend that pastors up in Cleveland, uh, had a similar thing happen, had visitor come in and and after service, they came down to visit. The whole family that had visited come down, and, and this one man looked at him, pointed at him, and said, You, sir, are a professional. And so every time I see him now, every time I talk to Cliff, I, I call him the professional. <laughs> and he'll say, Flamethrower, flamethrower. You know, we, we, we get at each other sometimes. That's how we stay sane, you know, sometimes. By doing that, <clears throat> but I'll do better tonight because I sat by these two good men. They are good men. Amen. Before we get into the scripture, <clears throat> before we get into the lesson tonight, I was talking to Sister Kathy before church, and I just want to touch on this a little bit because I have been asked this by several people, and that is what to make of what's happening in Israel right now with the change, with the elections they have had. Uh, Netanyahu is out, as you know, after a 12-year run, and uh, we have uh, a new prime minister. And uh, folks are asking, want to know what I think about that, and I guess my response would be, I don't know yet what I think about that. Time will tell. Only time will tell. What I do know, if you haven't been uh, aware of this and you haven't been looking at this, it's a rather bizarre uh, a thing that they're doing over there. And that is that two different parties have come together, and they're not parties that see things alike at all. One is a very uh, conservative party. The other is a uh, kind of a centrist party. And the two of them, out of uh, the two parties, and of course the two men as well, uh, but out of their hatred for Netanyahu, kind of like something that happened here, you know, a little while back, uh, out of their hatred for him, they determined to join forces and and get him out of office. Now, you know, Netanyahu has been there for 12 years, and he has done a good job as far as keeping Israel safe. Uh, he's under investigation, currently under investigation for corruption. And one of the things that they say, the reason they put him out is because of that. But we don't know that. We'll have to see how all of that pans out. What we know is that this bizarre approach they're taking, and I probably won't get these names right, but Naf Naftali Bennett is the new prime minister of Israel. And it's, it's kind of strange because he's the leader of the conservative party, and this other guy named Lapid, I believe, L-A-P-I-D, is the leader of the more centrist party. And the uh, Lapid, the centrist party leader, is going to be serving as the foreign minister for the first two years while Bennett serves as prime minister. And then after two years, they're going to flip and this, uh, this uh, Lapid is going to become the prime minister and serve out the term. It's... It's a kind of strange approach, but what's, what's pretty remarkable about it is the, the leader of the conservative party, Bennett, that is now the prime minister, he does not believe in a two-state solution. He does not believe in giving any ground whatsoever to the Arab nations that are confronting Israel. And if you've watched the news any at all in the last couple of days, you saw where uh, Hamas sent up these incendiary balloons 
And boy, it didn't take this new guy, it didn't take him long at all. They sent some bombs in there and blew up some buildings where, where uh, uh, Hamas was uh, operating out of to send a strong message very quickly. Now, the guy that's going to follow him, the Lapid guy, the, the more uh, centrist leader, has already stated that Netanyahu sort of cozied up here in the United States, cozied up more with the Republican Party and the conservative Christians. And while he's thankful for that, he, he wants to get a little bit closer to the Democratic Party, he says, and those are his words, and the more liberal uh, folks in America. And so uh, we, don't, we just don't know how this is going to pan out. I tell you what I tend to do when I, when I think of the leaders, they're not kings now, they're prime ministers, but they serve in a, in a capacity that is historically known in Israel as, as the king. And when I view these guys, whether it's Netanyahu or whether it's this new guy, Bennett, whoever it may be, I sort of view them from a biblical perspective. In other words, I wonder, I don't know about you, but I have wondered if the writers of the Bible were writing the Bible today, in our day, would they have anything to say about the leader Netanyahu, for example, the last 12 years, the leader of Israel and what's been going on over there. And, and that's how I view them. I look at them in sort of the same vein as the Uzziahs or whoever, it, whoever the, the, the Hezekiah or whoever the king has been was of Israel. And like the kings of Israel, you know, time would prove what kind of leaders they would be and how they would rule the people and how they would administer to the people. And we'll see that. We, we have this track record of Netanyahu now, of course, and he's not going away, by, by the way. He's, he's staying very much involved in politics and wants to come back one day and be prime minister again. He may or may not. But we do always, as Christians, need to keep our eyes open to what's happening over there. This new fellow that is uh, Bennett, that is uh, the prime minister now, uh, he's just 49 years old. He's 49 years old. He, he's born uh, from American parents living over there. He's a former military man from the Special Forces. And so he has a, even though he's a little bit younger man, he has a pretty rich background. The, uh, <clears throat> the guy that's going to follow him, Lapid, the centrist party guy, he doesn't have much background at all in politics. In fact, for a brief period of time, he worked under and with uh, uh, Netanyahu. And then he turned on him and, uh, and went against him, and these guys joined forces to get him out. So... As a Christian, we're just going to watch. We're going to observe what happens over there. They will be tested. They will be tried. I promise you that. Iran and these nations, these, these uh, folks that hate them, will see to it that they are tested and tried. And we'll see how it pans out. So if you're asking me, Pastor, what do you think this means as it relates to end times? I don't really know yet. Let's give it a little bit of time. Or the Lord could just go ahead and come on and deal with it right now, right? We'll see. We'll see how it works out. So let's go back tonight to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And I just want to look at, at the first verse again. And here's what we're going to try to do tonight. If we can, we're going to try to go through this whole first chapter, this entire first chapter, if we can. But in the first verse it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, you need to pay very careful attention to where it says, The vision of Isaiah, and also to where it says, Which he saw. If you underscore or make notes in your Bible, you might want to underscore those words or make a, a note in the margin there because those are very, very important words, and we'll look at that here in a moment. But I have all day in looking over this and putting this together, really more than today, I have viewed what we're about to look at tonight 
uh, kind of as an overlay to this nation that we're in. You know, Isaiah lived at a time when Israel, when the people of God is actually Judah, the, the northern and, and southern kingdoms had already parted and Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel was pretty much gone by now. It was just Judah, but we, for the sake of identity, we just say Israel and refer to them as God's people. But, but he lived at a time when they had turned their back on God, this nation that had been so blessed and so favored of the Lord, if you will, so so uh, raised up by God, he lived at a time when they turned their back on him. And as we go through this tonight, I think you'll see this. I view, I view where we are in America in a very similar place. We are presently, right now, turning our back on God as a nation. As a nation from the top, from the very top down. And I don't just mean culturally and societally. I mean even the church in America today is in a, is in a troubling place. And such was the case, the priests and the lawgivers and the scribes and the supposed spiritual leaders of Isaiah's time, they had all neglected God. And so what I want to encourage you to do tonight is to kind of see us, our people, our nation, our churches in a very similar place to where Israel was. But he starts off by saying, and we're not going to go all the way back to verse 1. In looking at this, we're going to, we're going to pick up a little bit later in the chapter. But it's, it's important that we look at this where he says, The vision of Isaiah which he saw concerning uh, Judah and Jerusalem. Now that's important because Isaiah announces, if you will, that he, that he saw this. This was a vision given to him. In other words, it was not just foreknowledge that he had. It was not just something that, that he had been told, hey, this is going to happen. He literally sees this in a vision. He visualizes what is coming upon his people. And he is every bit as convinced of its reality. He has no doubts as to it happening any more than what he would see or you and I would see with the natural eye. If you've ever had a vision from God, then you know what Isaiah is talking about. It's a real and a powerful thing. And Isaiah has to write. He has to, to uh, warn the people and call the people back to God because he has seen what is coming their way. They are his people. They are God's people. And as God's people, they are bound to love him. And they are bound to serve him and to be grateful to God for his many mercies that he had given to them. They are bound to be entirely obedient to God in the same way that we are bound to be entirely obedient to God. Has He not blessed us? Has He not brought us out of sin? Did He not purchase us with His own blood? And do we not owe Him our lives? Do we not owe Him our obedience? Do we not owe Him our love? Surely we do. And Isaiah viewed Israel in the same way. But they were not giving him their love. And they were not giving him their obedience. He had been, God had been the author of their very being. He had sustained their life. He had fed them. He had supported them. He had given them their every blessing. He had brought them literally from, uh, from a family into a great nation. And not just a great nation, but the prominent nation of the earth. God had brought them every step of the way and multiplied their numbers. He had given them a land that flowed with milk and honey. And they owed their lives to God and they owed their testimony to God because he had been so good to them, but they had failed him. And they didn't care that they had failed him. You know, someone said that the more we are blessed, it increases our responsibilities. And that's so true. The more God blesses us, the more we owe God. And the more we ought to be letting our light shine before a man, before others, 
that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. But that wasn't happening with Israel. And Isaiah is raised up at a time to see this and he laments over this and he calls the people back to God. They have acknowledged none of their obligations. They've rebelled against God. They've turned away. They've turned their back on his words. They have refused to have him in their thoughts. And when you read this chapter, really this whole chapter is an indictment. There's a promise in this chapter that we'll get to. But this whole chapter is an indictment of Israel for turning their backs on God. And if I were asked to sort of sum it up in a, in, in, in a verse or two, it'd probably be verse 22 and verse 23 where it says, Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come before them. In, in other words, you are a shell of what you have been and what you have known because of your turning your back on God. And folks, we're headed that way as a, as a nation in America. We're headed that way. And we're coming up on the 4th of July. We're coming up on Independence Day. And we got more and more outspoken people that want to deny us the reality of what even happened in our history and the fact that God had anything to do with it. You've been, I don't need to go into all that. You've been seeing that. You, you saw the school, was it in Virginia? Wipes out all holidays, completely all of them. Until, until the community said enough's enough. And now, guess what? The school board's about to have another meeting to reconsider. I, the fact that that stuff even happens is incredible. But they want to take your Christmas away. They want to take your Thanksgiving away. They want to take your Easter away. They might even be willing to leave if you said they'll keep Juneteenth and some of these other uh, holidays they've come up with, but they take your religious holidays away if you let them, your Christian holidays. It's a shame what is happening in our culture in the same way that it happened in Israel's uh, uh, society back in, in Isaiah's day. He says that thy wine is mixed with water. In other words, a weakened iteration of the preceding power of who you have been and what you have known. Now, let me ask this question before we get into verse 4 here. What, what claim does God have on them? I mean, I mean, for God to say, I'm, you're being judged and you're going to be judged. I'm going to see to it. I mean, who, what grounds does God have to do that? Well, every ground in the world because they're his children. He made them great. He brought them out of bondage. He formed them and exalted them and made them great among the nations. And he has every claim to do that. What claim does God have to judge America today? Every claim in the world. He brought us here and he formed us and he helped us become the people that we have become because we founded this nation. I don't care what they're telling you. We founded this nation on Judeo-Christian values and claimed God and claimed his son. And he has every right to judge this nation. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit later here tonight. That's not popular to say. People don't want to hear that. But Isaiah begins to lament over the wickedness and the lack of repentance. And so in verse 4, it starts off this way. Ah, sinful nation. Ah, sinful nation. In other words, it ought to be holy nation. It's a nation that's called to be holy, but they have sunk so low in sin that they are referred to as a sinful nation. They've forsaken the Lord, and here's one of the most, 
Here's one of the most pointed indictments that comes against Israel here in all of this. They have forsaken the Lord, but not by renouncing worship and sacrifice. In other words, they didn't stop going to church. They went to church the whole time they're doing this. They kept marching right on up to the choir the whole time they're living this way. They kept offering sacrifices to God. They kept observing the Sabbath the whole time they're living this way. But it's always a matter of the heart more than it is the external things that we do. So they didn't renounce worship, but what they did was they reduced it to a formality. And that's why in chapter 29 it says they honored him with their lips while their hearts were far from him. You've heard that verse. And in verse 6 of this first chapter it says from the sole of the foot even unto the head. You are wasted, he tells them. You're one big sore. You're one big boil. You're corrupt from the top of the head to the sole of the foot. And in verse 7 he says, Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Listen, there are very real consequences to rejecting God. Is it hot in here? Is the air on? Brother Dirk, could you check and see? I I see y'all waving and... I have hard enough time on midweek keeping you awake as it is. And if you get hot and get distracted, I'm going to have a hard, hard time. I appreciate that. I, I can sense you, and I'm feeling it a little bit too. But, folks, we've always said it pays to live for God, and it does. There are also consequences for rejecting God. A family that rejects God, a person that rejects God, a nation that rejects God, there are going to be consequences. And Israel lay in ruins. Israel was a, as I said a moment ago, a shell of the nation they have been. Everything's upside down. They're corrupt completely because they have rejected God. He tells them that their land is a desolation. A complete desolation. It's been ravaged by an enemy and their towns have been burned and their crops have been devoured because they have rejected God. God would have kept them. God would have given them victory. God would not have allowed these invading armies to come in and take his people like that had they been true to him. And I want to tell you a whole lot of the things we're seeing in this nation today from the economic all the way up into the political it's all because we have rejected God and are rejecting God as a nation and when God looks upon the state of the church in America today and he sees what we're allowing and not just allowing but what we have embraced as a church we've embraced it we've liked it then what else can God do but pronounce the consequences that are to come. You know, he says something in verse 8 here that we might not get on the surface. He refers to them as a, as a cottage, a cottage in a vineyard, or he refers to them as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers in verse 8. Now, what in the world does that mean when God calls them a cottage in a vineyard? Well, Vineyards required to be watched for a few weeks as the fruit began to ripen. It had to be taken at the right time. And so watchers or keepers as they were called would often build themselves little temporary covers, little booths, if you will. And there's a reference to that, by the way, in Job chapter 27. They would build themselves little coverings so that while they were out there watching for the ripening of the fruit, they would be protected. But that little booth they were in, that little cottage they were in, was was terribly deficient. It was nothing like living quarters. Again, it was a shell of 
something that could be much greater. And that's what God means when he says, Isaiah means, when he's uh, giving the word of the Lord to the people, that as far as them as a nation, they have reduced themselves to being a little cottage, a little booth in a vineyard compared to the great nation they have known themselves to be. Same thing as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers. It's really the same meaning there. And so they have done this and they have done it claiming God as their God. They have done it, as I said, going to church. Going to church. Now, the reason we know that is because of these verses we're about to read together, beginning with verse 11 and reading through verse 15. To what purpose... This is God now through Isaiah speaking to his people. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, that means sacrifices. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. In other words, that's a description of a very religious people outwardly. That's people going to church. That's people observing the Sabbath. That's people going into the temple. That's people making sure that they don't forget to consider God in their outward manifestations of whatever they call their religion, but there's no heart in it. There's no meaning in it for them. And God says, I don't even want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to smell it. I don't want anything to do with it because you're corrupt to the core. I want to tell you something, folks. It's a strange thing with we human beings how deeply ingrained an idea we have That formal acts of worship, outward acknowledgement, ritual, display, ceremony constitute anything of value to God. It doesn't. It's meaningless to God. In fact, it angers God. There's only one thing that will be accepted to God and that's inward devotion of the heart. Now, God is not calling, and, and Isaiah here is not calling for them to, to for there to be a complete uh, 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 ceasing of all outward worship, of all outward forms. That's not what's going on here. But as long as it's fake and not real, God would rather not have it. Just like, just like you and me, if we live like the devil and come out here to church... And if we don't repent, now if we repent, if we come to church and get convicted and repent and and get back in the altar and come back to God and make it right with Him, then that's wonderful. But we live like the devil all week long and go to church and and gloss over that and fake it as if we're some kind of holy, righteous person, religious person. And I don't care if we're singing, playing, preaching, teaching. I don't care what we're doing. If If that's the extent of it, God says, I don't want it. I don't want any of it. It's got to be motivated out of a heart. And the Pharisees did the same thing, by the way. This is just human nature. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. By the way, those are plants, if you want to know. You pay tithes of these things, but listen to what he says. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. That's Jesus talking to the religious Pharisees of his day. 
They did it too. And let me tell you, people do it today. Churches are full of people that do it today. Isaiah nor God want to abolish sacrifice, but what they're really calling for is the outward manifestations of worship that are adorned with self-dedication, self-surrender, and devotion of the heart toward God. Then it's acceptable and pleasing unto the Lord. Now, there's, a, there's going to be a remedy of this, and all of these following verses, really the whole chapter, as I said, but right on down through verse 17, it's just one description after another of how rotten the people are, how evil the people are, how unrighteous. But there's a remedy in verse 18 where the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And the first thing for me that I find amazing about that verse is that God invites the people to come and reason with him. That's, that's staggering to me. That God would let a finite creation of his own hand reason with him you know God does that occasionally and has done that occasionally but only occasionally the Bible tells us of a time when he did that in Genesis 18 with Sarah about how she didn't believe she could have a child and you know she sort of said something under her breath about it and the Lord said what did you say let's let's talk about what you said there and there's that opportunity to kind of talk and reason with the Lord. We see it again in Exodus uh, chapter 4 with Moses, where Moses reasons with the Lord about him going down and, and bringing the children of Israel out. We see it again in Job chapter 23, where Job is sort of re trying anyway. You really can't, but tries to reason with God. It's amazing to me that God would in his Long suffering and grace and mercy would allow us in any capacity whatsoever to reason with him. But that's what he, he loves his people so much. He cares about them so much that he says, come, let's reason together. And then he sort of immediately goes into this statement here that though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And then he uses the other metaphor of, of wool, white as pure as wool. And both of those metaphors, whether it's, whether it's white snow or whether it's wool, it's the image of purity. Purity. It, from, from the red, from the red, it's so obvious, it's so out there, it's so glaring, your sins are so glaring like red blood, but they shall be pure as snow and as wool. You know, the psalmist said, the psalmist David said when he'd sinned against God, and when he came back to God in repentance, he said in Psalm 51, 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Isn't it a good feeling to be whiter than snow because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let me hurry along. The Lord makes no mistake about it in saying in verse 28 that destruction is coming to the ungodly. He says in verse 28, And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. It's going to happen. And it is happening to his people even as Isaiah speaks these words. But the Lord makes sure and he always has made sure that out of destruction there will be some. There will always be some for whom the purifying power of the judgment of God will convert, will come back to God, will repent. And there will always be a remnant there, always. Some people never repent. Some people just get harder and harder in their sins. But some, for the judgment of the Lord, they come back to him. Verse 25 says, And I will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin. And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. 
Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. In other words, from this judgment of God that's coming, a people will rise up and be a new people of God. Hallelujah. And I do believe that even though we are in trouble as a nation today, and I do believe that even though the church is in a bad place today, I believe God has a remnant. I believe God has a people. And I believe that even out of the judgment and the troubling times that we're in, I believe God is going to raise up a people that will be the new people of God. Amen. And live in righteousness before him. And I want to be that kind of people, don't you? I want our church to be that kind of people and that kind of church in these last days. May we strive to live that way. Let me just mention this before we close. He says here in this verse 26, I will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning. What does that mean? Well, what that simply means is that in the early times, in the early days of the nation, They weren't, their judges and their counselors, their leaders, if you will, they weren't, they wouldn't allow themselves to be subject to bribery. They wouldn't allow themselves to be perverted by injustice. He mentions the widows here in this passage. They took care of the widows. They took care of the fatherless. And those were the early days, for example, the days of Moses and Joshua, if you will. And what the Lord is saying here is that I will bring you back and you will be as you were then. Praise God. There's always hope with the Lord. You know, one thing about about Israel, if you look at them historically, you know, Israel went into captivity, as you know, Babylonian captivity for 70 years, and they pretty much... I mean, they were destroyed as a people. If you look at them historically, from the time of the return from captivity until present, even until this day, Israel has been truer to God than they were prior to the captivity. It's amazing what that did and the memory and the history of that did. Now, we know, they, we know that they're not accepting Christ as Messiah, I, but I'm talking about their, their view of God, Jehovah God, Yahweh, if you will. They've been truer to God as a people from the time of the return of the captivity than they were prior to. And, of course, that's what we're looking at here. It's an amazing thing when you look at their history. And the last thing we'll look at is verse 27, and I promised you we'd talk about this real quick, and I'll let you go. Verse 27 says, Zion, this is amazing, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. Zion shall be delivered through judgment, is what he's saying. In other words, God's judgment upon them will have the effect of delivering them and bringing out the remnant that will follow him. And then he says, and her converts with righteousness. Zion shall be redeemed with judgments, with judgment and her converts with righteousness. What's meant by her converts with righteousness is that her children who turn to God will turn to God through the righteous vengeance that he executed upon the unfaithful nation. They won't have to go through what the unfaithful nation had to go through, the judgment of God, to be redeemed. Isn't that good? Now the reason I wanted to bring that out is you can't say that anymore in our day and time. You can't say God is judging America. You'll get in trouble. You'll get in trouble. You'll get in trouble in society. You know, if if a catastrophe happens in America, if if a natural disaster or anything else happens in this land, and a Christian anywhere gets up and says, this is the judgment of God upon us. 
Oh, I want to tell you they'll beat him or her into absolute silence. The media will excoriate them. The politicians on both sides will excoriate them. And even the church, even the church will excoriate them. Because we believe, we've adopted this kind of thought that because we're in the day of grace, we're in the day of salvation, we're in the day of Christ, that there can be absolutely no judgment of any kind until the end times. That's what we think. That's what we've been taught. But you know, that's not true. I read in my Bible in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 30 and 31, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, it says in the New Testament, in the day of the church. Yeah, I do believe some things that happen are the judgments of God upon us. And whether it is the direct hand of God, you can view it any way you want to, it doesn't matter, but whether it's the direct hand of God or whether it is, as I have illustrated, whether it is us walking out from under the umbrella of His care and it rains upon us, you know, like you would if you walked out from under a shelter somewhere and and it rains on you and you had not got sense enough to get in out of the rain and you're going to blame God for it raining on you. No, it's probably not God. It's probably the the fact that you walked out from under the shed, out from under the covering that's before you, and whether it's the direct hand of God or whether it's walking out from under His care and providence over us and allowing judgment to come to us, either way, it falls under the category of failing and rejecting God as a people. And I do believe that there are things that happen, not everything, but there are things that happen that are the judgment of God, whether direct judgment or permissive, it happens. Now, I don't much care whether they, whether they like me saying that or not. I'm going to have to say it because I have to say it. He's made me to say it. Stand with me. And so what, do, what is it we do? What is it we must do and we must strive to do? What Brother Jimmy sang about tonight, it's my desire to live for Jesus It's my desire to serve Him. And that's what I want to do. And I'm going to fail, and you're going to fail, and we're going to stumble along the way. But we're not going to turn our backs on His Word, are we? We're not going to do that. We're going to keep striving. And the Lord is going to raise us up. I do believe He's going to raise us up. Amen. This is going to be, folks, a great study. And by the way, it really does get a lot more positive as we go. Now, there's a lot of negative in Isaiah because he's, turn, he's trying to turn the people back. But, oh, I want to tell you some of the greatest words of promise in all of the Bible come out of the book of Isaiah. And concerning Christ and His coming, the Messiah and all of that, I can't, in fact, we, we're not going to have to go far. We're going to right into the second chapter. We're going to get into some of those great promises as we start chapter 2 next week, the Lord willing. So let's be ready. Read ahead. Read ahead. That's your assignment. And we'll be ready to go next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you tonight for your holy word. And more than that, Lord, thank you for your presence and for your call and for the work you have done in us. And Lord, we are grateful. We are mindful of your mercies and your grace. And we want to retain that in our thinking and in our decisions and in how we walk out life. And I pray that you'll help us, Lord, to exemplify that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.